Welcome to a look ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this is a series entitled Life Everlasting on Death, Dying, and the Future Hope. And this lesson, number eight in that series for November 19 of 2022 is entitled The New Testament Hope. So now we've We've been working away from the Old Testament through the life of Christ, who is his death, Gethsemane, Calvary, the resurrection. And now, what became of all that? What did the disciples have to say and of all that? So that will be our discussion uh, for today. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our Father, as we think about these monumental events that we've been discussing, the life and death of Jesus and his resurrection, Help us to know exactly all that it implies for us, and may we take maximum benefit from it, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. First John 5, 11 and 12 sets forth the challenge in trying to understand who will be saved in the end of time. And Jim, could you read that for us? The testimony is this. God has given his, us, excuse me, God has given us eternal life, and this life will be, has its source in his Son. Whoever has the Son has this life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. American Bible Society. Okay, that raises several questions. Is it true that only those who are in Christ will have eternal life? That's what you just read. That immediately disproves the idea that we have natural immortality. If only those who are believers in Christ will experience immortality at the second coming. Isn't that, isn't that not true? Well, he's also said in John 17, 3, that eternal oh, life sure, is in the Father. There's other, Jesus. there's other places that, yeah, we could add to. It is clear that the idea of the soul departing from the body at the time of death was a Greek pagan idea. Nothing of that sort Nothing of that sort appears in the Hebrew Scriptures anywhere. The New Testament writers and apostles uh, support the idea that a future hope is dependent upon a resurrection from the dead or a translation from, for, from the living when Jesus comes back the second time. So why? Here's your first question. Why do you think that pagan idea has become so widely believed in our day? Part of Satan's deception. Okay, so we've accepted the gospel of Satan. We have. Most of the world has. Any other ideas why that might be true? I, I'm inclined to think, and this is just my idea, but I'm inclined to think that people people hang on to the idea that this person is not really dead. He, he, I, maybe I can't see him, maybe he's gone somewhere, but he's still li alive somewhere. People, people like to think that. Comforting. It's comforting. They're looking this for idea of a resurrection to God was not new. What evidence do we have for it way back? Jim? No, oh, Gary. 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 John 8. And back it said, Jesus said, your father Abraham rejoiced that he was to see the time of my coming. He saw it and was glad. So way back in the days of Abraham, and even further back, the next passage. Jude 14 and 15. It was Enoch, the seventh direct descendant from Adam, who long ago prophesied this about them. The Lord will come with many thousands of his holy angels to bring judgment on all to condemn them all for the godless deeds they have performed and for all the terrible words that godless sinners have spoken against him from the Good News Bible. Okay, so Enoch had the idea that there was going to be some kind of coming and that this was going to bring about a judgment. Uh, Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, 39 and 40. What a record all of these have won by their faith. Yet, they did not receive what God had promised because God had decided on an even better plan for us. His purpose was that only in the company, his purpose was that only in company with us would they be made perfect. 
So all the saints are, are buried in their graves because God is saying, when the time comes, I want all of them to be raised at the same time. Okay? Except for Moses, who yeah. was raised, and those who were raised at Jesus' yeah. first resurrection. We're going to get to that. <laughs> if only those who have a saving relationship with Jesus Christ have eternal life, then there's no such thing as an immortal soul possessed by every person. 500 years before Christ, the Greek historian Herodotus spoke about a tribe who at birth began a period of mourning because they believed this infant would suffer if it lived to adulthood. I mean, that's just crazy. Close to our day, an advertising agency in America early in the 20th century said, why live if you can be buried for $10? <laughs> you can't be buried for $10 anymore. Not, not in our day, you can't. Not here anyway. Yeah. Okay, from the Bible study guide. Who's next? You. Me, I guess. More than one secular writer has commented on the meaninglessness of human existence. Since we all not only die, but we all also live with the realization that we are going to die. And this realization is what makes the whole project of human life, which is often hard and sorrowful in and of itself, seemingly null and void. One thinker referred to humans as nothing but, don't you love this, hunks of spoiling flesh on disintegrating bones. Rather, rather macabre, but again, it's hard to argue with the logic. So is that what we are? That's from the Bible study guide. Yeah, recorded. They didn't make it up. If one accepts the idea of evolution, that idea must be the truth. We will, we're nothing more than uh, hunks of spoiling flesh on disintegrating bones. What other options does the evolutionist have? Are you happy to be a hunk of spoiling flesh on disintegrating bones? Why do, why do the evolutionists choose to, I mean, they, they, they don't want to talk about this, but why do they, why are they stuck with that? Why don't they they don't want to face a judgment. They don't they, want to face God. Exactly. They don't want to take they, responsibility for their actions and their thoughts. They don't want to think that someday they're going to have to face God. Is it better to say, I'm just going to be rotting flesh? Wow. This is all nonsense to those who understand and believe in Jesus Christ. Just as he rose from the dead in his own power, he certainly has the power to resurrect those who trust him at the second coming. Jim? Now, since our message is that Christ has been raised from death, how can some of you say that the dead will not be raised to life? If that is true, it means that Christ was not raised. And if Christ has not been raised from death, then we have nothing to preach and you have nothing to believe. More than that, we are shown to be lying about God because we said, as he was raised Christ from the death, but if it is true that the dead are not raised to life, then he did not raise Christ. For it is the, for if the death, excuse me, if the dead are not raised, neither has Christ been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is a delusion and you are still lost in your sins. It would also mean that the believers in Christ who have died are lost. If our hope in Christ is good for this life and only, excuse me, for this life only and no more, then we deserve more pity than anyone else in all the world. Good News Bible. From 1 well, Corinthians 15, 12 through 19. Yeah. Is it true that living a Christian life right now is a pitiful existence? I don't think so. I think the best way to live right now is, I mean, we live here in a place that's called the Blue Zone. And what does that mean? We live happier, healthier, longer lives. Is that a pitiful existence? But Paul, I mean, think of what Paul went through. Yeah, every day he's wondering, is he going to be stoned? Is he going to be beaten to death? Is he going to be, you know, maybe even crucified? Well, he couldn't be crucified because he was a Roman citizen. Or is living a Christian life the best way to live on this earth right now? Why are so many people in our day 
rejecting Christianity. Gary? First Corinthians 15:32. If I have, as it were, fought wild beasts here in Ephesus simply from human motives, what have I gained? But if the dead are not raised to life, then as the saying goes, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. That's the Sadducees' plan, right? From the Bible Study Guide, if our present existence as carbon-based protoplasm is all there is, and our three score and 10 years, if we are fortunate, more if, we're, if we don't smoke or eat too many hamburgers, <laughs> are all that we get ever, we're in pretty tough shape. No wonder Ellen White adds, heaven is worth everything to us. And if we lose heaven, we lose all. That's portions from Sons and Daughters of God. And, and the whole thing is from Bible Study Guide for Sunday. Thus it is fair to say that the light and the hope of the Christian are in the statement that Jesus made repeatedly, I will come again. Do we believe those words? Myra? John 14, one to three, Jesus said, do not be worried and upset, Jesus told him. Believe in God and believe also in me. There are many rooms in my Father's house and I'm going to prepare a place for you. I will not tell you, I would not tell you this if it were not so. And I go to prepare that place for you, a place for you. I will come again and take you to myself so that you will be where I am. That's a wonderful text. Okay, let me ask you a question that's not on our guide here, just to think about. If you had been a given assignment as a news reporter, just to follow the life of Christ, life of Jesus here on this earth, at what point would you decide that he was something other than just another human being? Considering what we know, considering what evidence we have of his life, at what point would you say, hmm? Well, the first mir miracle that we have recorded is the wedding feast in Cana, mm -hmm. certainly by then. Okay. Perhaps even before that at the, uh, in the temptations in the wilderness and the... And Which the, most uh, people would, yeah. And the deny the confrontation between God and the devil, between Jesus and the devil. And the voice heard from heaven at, at his baptism. Yeah, at his baptism. But you could go back and even say, now this is a, not something that was widely known, but what about the miraculous appearances before his birth? To Mary and to Joseph, saying, you know, this person, this, and they knew, maybe the other people, everybody's raising questions about it, but Mary and Joseph knew that this wasn't some kind of a ordinary human being. This baby came from somewhere else. They knew. And there's the getting out of Herod's territory mm -hmm. to Egypt to mm -hmm. avoid being killed at that time. Yeah. Another of Satan's and attempts why to, did, do, to eliminate Jesus. And why did those three or four or maybe more kings from the Far East show up to celebrate his birth? How many Bringing kids? Great gifts. How many? How many kids had that happen to them? But I think the, the later in his life, when he raised Lazarus mm -hmm. in that community that knew Lazarus was dead, mm -hmm. he stinks. Yeah. <laughs> you know that would be quite convincing. Yeah. What is it? Wasn't that? Or he says, if the word gets out about Jesus, the whole world's going to follow it. No, excuse yeah. me. If the word gets out, yeah, uh, it would have the whole world follow after him. Yeah. But uh, this this is about Lazarus in race, was it not? Mm-hmm. Okay. As a result of Lazarus' resurrection, yeah. 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 Does the fact that 2,000 years have passed make you think that the promise is not true? I mean, I'm coming soon? Is 2,000 years soon? Well, lifespans are relatively short, so. <laughs> Not to me it isn't. Jesus repeated that promise to John in the book of Revelation four times. Where are we, is it Gordon? Revelation uh, 3, 11. This message is 
This message came from the one who is holy and true. I am coming soon. Keep safe what you have so that no one will rob you of your victory prize from Good News Bible. And from Revelation 22, 7, and 12 and 20. Listen, says Jesus, I'm coming soon. Happy are those who obey the prophetic words in this book. Listen, says Jesus, I'm coming soon. I will bring my rewards with me and I, with me to give to each one according to what he has done. He who gives his testimony to all this says, yes, indeed, I am coming soon. Okay, so why does God keep saying, I'm coming soon, I'm coming soon, I'm coming soon, and then thousands of years go by? Time is not the same for God as it is for us. Mm -hmm. but he's talking to us. I know he's talking mm -hmm. to us, but the somewhere disciples, we're missing something. The disciples clearly thought it was soon. They thought they, you know, Paul thought that he, the Jesus was going to show, show up before he died. I think the, all the apostles thought yeah. he was going to return before they died. Yeah, exactly. I remember my, you know, I was in first grade, first or second grade, and my teacher asked me, do you think Christ is going to come in your lifetime? Mm -hmm. Well, of course I did. Mm -hmm. I still do. And I'm, uh, you know, I, I think about my life, my children's life, and my grandchildren's life. And I, and this is pure speculation, but of course I spent a lot of time studying the Bible and Ellen White, but I think there's a 50% chance that he will come in my life. There's a more than that, 75 or 95% chance he will come in my children's life. And I think there must be, unless they're, they die prematurely, there must be a 100% chance that he will come in the lives of my grandchildren. Just. Of course, that's what's been thought for hundreds and hundreds of years. Yeah. Yep. But I think you are correct. Yeah. Okay. Who's next? I read the last one. Okay, that would be me. Second Peter 3, 3 and 4 and 9. They will mock you and will ask, he promised to come, didn't he? Where is he? Our ancestors have already died, but everything is still the same as it was since the creation of the world. Here's a prediction of the ideas of evolution 2,000 years ago. The Lord is not slow to do what he has promised, as some think. Instead, he is patient with you because he do, does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants all to turn away from their sins. And of course, who knows most of all that that's not going to happen, but he wants it to happen. The devil. Are you glad that Jesus didn't return before you were born? I am. Is that a selfish, selfish answer? It's yeah. as selfish as can be, I guess. How will God know that everyone who is going to respond has responded? Is that what he's waiting for? What will cause the, the close of probation? Ellen White tells us that there will come a time when there will be crises on this world, and I don't, it, I, yeah, I, you, it just seems like that is happening now. Crisis will come when everybody Everybody will be informed. I mean, and think how widespread through the internet and everything else, how, how the information is spread almost, I mean, something happens important in the world and it seems like everybody knows about it almost instantly, that everyone will make it, will, will be forced to make a decision and the decision will be made and it will be reported back to heaven saying, okay, they've all made up their mind and God says, okay, there's no reason to wait any longer. So what about the two-year-olds? Well, God will decide about them. That's, he, he knows what their lives would be if they continued to live. In light of the history of the great controversy and the history of the entire universe, our lives are infinitesimally short. We know that if we, were, we are faithful and if we close, close our eyes in death, the next thing we will know and see is the second coming of Jesus. We've already talked about that in previous things, but it's Psalm 90, verse 10, Ecclesiastes 9, 5 and 10, and Hebrews 9, 27, just as some places you can look at. 
Do you see evidence in the world today that the final events of this world's history are happening around us? Uh, you look at what's going on in the world and how Boy. quickly things can change. I mean, COVID, uh, just, I mean. Yeah. Yep, exactly. Well, I, you know, the thing that I have noticed in, no, and we all have noticed, I'm sure, that we maybe not have put in these exact words. Everything prophesied in the Bible has taken place except the events which are directly connected with the second coming. Nothing else is, of all the things that, are being, that have been prophesied by the Bible, it's all happened except the, for those events which are directly connected with the second coming. That should be worth something. In John 6, the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000 and, and so forth and all that that ha happened after that. And what happened as a result of that? What was the immediate response from all the people? Let's make this guy king. Let's make him king. A man, if he can feed us like this every day, what do we have? I, I mean, if someone dies, he can raise them back to life. I mean, there's nothing. I mean, if you wanted, if there was any criteria that you could just d even dream about for a king, he would meet those criteria, wouldn't he? Well, the story in John 6 with Jesus feeding 5,000 men, not counting women and children, so it could have been up to 20,000 people, is a familiar one. It led to an enormous swell of emotion from the people in Galilee who were determined to make him king by force if necessary. Now I want to ask you a couple of questions. What do you think the little boy who gave his lunch to Jesus said to his mother when he got home that night? Yeah. <laughs> Your lunch was a hit. <laughs> I, I, I think he probably went running in the house. He said, Mom, guess what? Jesus took my lunch and from it he fed thousands of people. I mean, I, 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 he must have just... Yeah. Hmm. Well, if such a thing ever happened in our day, how do you think it would be reported by the news media? I, I, I often think about these things in this context. You know, how would it be reported today? It didn't happen. Yeah. They'd be lying some way. How, I mean, how could you say it didn't happen? There's all these people who ate. It was trickery. Yeah. Someone pulled a fast one, huh? Delusion. So what did the people of Galilee who heard that speech from Jesus think of his statement, I will raise him, the believer, up on the last day? They were, they were, they were rushing to make him king. So what did they think when he said that? Were they aware of the fact that Jairus' daughter had been raised from the dead? Well, it happened in that area. Or what about the son of the widow of Nain? And would that be, would that give them some idea of what Jesus was talking about, perhaps? What did Jesus mean when he said that his flesh was the bread that came down from heaven? How is he going to give us his flesh to eat and his blood to drink? How does that give us eternal life? And even this is a challenge, and some of them must have been shocked when he said that, because the Israelites had been strictly forbidden from eating blood. Let's look at that verse, Le Leviticus 17. The life of every living thing is in the blood, and that is why the Lord has commanded that all blood be poured out on the altar to take away the people's sins. Blood, which is life, takes away sins. That is why the Lord has told the people of Israel that neither they nor any foreigner living among them shall eat any meat with blood still in it. So, what's going on here? Is Jesus asking them to violate the rules of kosher? Okay, well, let's... No one's going to take up my challenge. No. <laughs> Don't have an answer for that one. Don't have an answer? No. 
Um, okay, from the writings of Ellen White. Who's Jim? The question comes home to us today. Are we eating the flesh and drinking the blood of the Son of God? It has been, to me, is it by it beholding is. the love of Christ, by drinking it in, by dwelling upon it, that we eat his flesh and drink his blood, becoming partakers of the divine nature? Ellen White. Okay. 19, 1892, she said. Think about this. Becoming partakers of the divine nature. Becoming partakers by eating his flesh and drinking his blood. And that happens how? What does it say there? Beholding the love of Christ. Beholding the love of Christ. And by dwelling upon it. Dwelling upon about it. Thinking about it. it. Yeah. What it means. Well, that's it has become knowing about it, mm -hmm. right? John mm -hmm. 17, 3 again. Understanding. Yep. And John 6, 26 through 51. Now, this is the last, second half of that story. Jesus walked across the waters. They're over there in Capernaum, and they're saying, you know, give us this food, etc. Jesus repeatedly stated that those who ate his flesh and drank his blood would have eternal life because he would raise them to life on the last day. Carrie? In his sermon, Jesus highlighted three basic concepts in regard to eternal life. First, he identified himself as the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. By declaring that I am... Uh, the Greek is ego eimi. Yes, the bread, the bread of life. Jesus presented... So hold on just a second. Let's... Okay, what language was Jesus speaking when he spoke these words? Aramaic. Aramaic. If you say, I am in Aramaic, or you say, I am in Hebrew, what does that mean? I am God. That's the, that's the expression, that's the name of God. So in his sermon, he said, I am God. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Jesus presented him. Yes, I am of the Old Testament. Second, Jesus explained that everlasting life can be secured in him. He who comes to me and he who believes in me will have this blessing. And finally, Jesus linked the gift of immortality with the final resurrection, assuring his audience three times, and I will raise him up at the last day. From our Bible study guide. After looking at these passages, there should not be... So, so again, yeah. why were they so shocked when Jesus re uh, came to life? Yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> I, my, both of my parents are dead. And, of course, he, they're buried in the cemetery not far from here. Um... I try to imagine, um, obviously they're very human people like me, but I'm trying to imagine if someone like that had, you know, you buried them and two or three days later you discover they rose up from the dead and they're doing all sorts of things. You, you, you would do a double take, a triple take, I don't know, how, you know, how, how would you relate to that? I mean, th I'm, I'm thinking about the disciples. I mean, it's just, it was so far from what they expected to happen that yeah. they were just sort of, huh? With their mouths hanging open. Well, after looking at these, at these passages, there should be not any question about that Christ, with, that without Christ, one cannot have eternal life. Is it true? that we can have eternal life right now? Well, Jesus says you'll go on living. Yeah. We have the start of eternal life. Well, is there any way to tell if one has eternal life right now? Who's doing the measuring? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's, that's what I'm asking you. <laughs> Only God knows that. What exactly happens at the second coming when the trumpet sounds? Do we understand the sequence? 
1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. Our brothers and sisters, we want you to know the truth about those who have died so that you will not be sad as are those who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will take back with Jesus those who have died believing in him. What we are teaching you now is the Lord's teaching. We who are alive on the day the Lord comes will not go ahead of those who have died. So let me interrupt for a second. Paul thought that he was going to be alive. We who are alive, okay? Verse 16, there will be a shout, the shout of command, the archangel's voice, the sound of God's trumpet, and the Lord himself will come down from heaven. Those who have died believing in Christ will rise to life first. Then we who are living at that time will be gathered up along with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. So then encourage one another with these words. Good News Bible. Many people who choose to believe that the spirit of the soul goes to heaven, read King James Version of 1 Thessalonians 4.14, and believe that Jesus will bring those souls or spirits with him down from heaven. This idea is completely out of agreement with all the rest of Scripture. Look at these words from a non-Adventist theologian regarding this verse. Someone who understands the Greek and so forth very well said this. The reason why the Thessalonian Christians can have hope as they grieve for the dead members of their church is that God will bring them, that is, he will resurrect these deceased believers and cause them to be present at Christ's return such that they will be with him. The implication is that the deceased believers will not be at some kind of disadvantage at the parousia. Para Parousia of Christ. That means his coming, his presence. Okay. But will be with him in such a way that they will share equally with the living believers in the glory associated with his return. Okay. Jeffrey Wyma is an interesting character. I think that's one of the guys that I led one of my trips to the Middle East. Oh. It should be obvious that when Paul spoke about the righteous, he was not talking about souls in heaven. He was talking about those who sleep in Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 55, listen to this special secret truth. We shall not all die, but when the last trumpet sounds, we shall all be changed in an instant. So how long is this going to take? An instant. As quickly as the blinking of an eye. For when the trumpet sounds, the dead will be raised, never to die again, and, we'll sh and we shall all be changed. For what is mortal must be changed into what is immortal. What will die must be changed into what cannot die. So when this takes place and the mortal has been changed into the immortal, then the scripture will come true. Death is destroyed. Victory is complete. Where death is your victory? Where death is your power to hurt? Jim, want to... Grab that. Oops, sorry. Where death is your power to hurt. Some popular preachers suggest that this mystery in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 is the secret rapture of the church, which they claim will occur seven years prior to Christ's glorious second coming. In this, quote, secret rapture, faithful Christians are suddenly, quietly, and secretly whisked off to heaven while everyone else remains here wondering what happened to them. Let me interrupt for a second. Some of us who've been for a while, around for a while, remember this was a very popular idea some time back, and there were, you know, bumper stickers or little things around the license plate would say, if, no, if this car is driverless, I've been raptured. That kind of stuff. Now we have electronic vehicles that yeah. there might be a driverless vehicle. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. Okay, go ahead. People might suddenly find themselves in a driverless car because the driver was, was raptured to heaven and all that remains is their clothes. The 16-volume best-selling Left Behind series Left Behind. Left Behind series turned into four movies providing this false teaching, exposing millions to it. Of course, 
No biblical passage endorses such an artificial distraction, distinction between the rapture and the second coming. The mystery Paul is referring to is simply the transformation of the living righteous to join the resurrected righteous at Christ's second coming. This is the, quote, rapture. There is no, quote, secret rapture because the second coming will be visible to all living human beings. Revelation 1, verse 7. And both the resurrection of the dead and the transformation of the living ones will occur at the sound of the trumpet at Christ's return. 1 Corinthians 15, 51, book from the Bible study guide for November and 17. And what does it say in Revelation 1, 7, Carrie? Look, he is coming on the clouds. Everyone will see him, including those who pierced him. All peoples on earth will mourn over him. So shall it be. Okay, so those who pierced him, how are they going to see the second coming? They have a special resurrection yeah. or something. There's something a like special that. resurrection. There's nothing secret about the second coming of Jesus or the resurrection of the righteous dead and the translation of the righteous living. Nothing like the second coming of Jesus Christ has ever happened on this earth. Can we even imagine the scene? People who have been dead will be popping out of the ground and ascending into the air while others still alive will be translated and rise at the same time to meet the Lord in the air. I. I try to think about something like the cemetery not far from here. Yeah. Can you imagine just people popping out of the ground? Wow. The idea that Christians have believed from the days of Jesus that we will rise at his second coming has been laughed at by many through the prior centuries. In the Bible study guide for Fri Friday, it says, the Romans, writes Stephen Cave, were well aware of the Christian's belief that they would one day rise bodily from the grave and did everything they could to mock and hinder those hopes. A report of a persecution in Gaul in about 177 Christian era records that the martyrs were first executed, then their corpses left to rot and buried for six days before being burned and the ashes thrown into the river Rhone. Now let us see whether they rise, whether they will rise again, the Romans were reported to have said that in immortality, etc., and mm -hmm. the reference is given. Bible study guide continuing. This little object lesson in theological skepticism, however dramatic, is beside the point. It proved nothing about the biblical promise of the resurrection. The power who raised Jesus from the dead can do the same for us as well, regardless of the state of our body. After all, if that same power created and upholds the entire cosmos, he certainly could translate the living and resurrect the dead from Bible Study Guide for Friday. Okay, and we're going to have different kinds of bodies because he's going to whisk us off in about a week from here to heaven somewhere. You can't do that with these bodies that we've got now. So, okay, Myra, you want to take on the next one there? Uh, Ellen G. White says, Even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. That's the verse that we mentioned earlier yeah, where people misinterpret. Paul wrote, Many interpret this passage to mean that the sleeping ones will be brought from Christ. Be brought with Christ. With Christ from heaven. But Paul meant that as Christ was raised from the dead, so God will call the sleeping saints from their graves and take them with him to heaven. Precious consolation, glorious hope, not only the church of Thessalonica, but to all Christians wherever they may be. It's from the Acts of the Apostles. And so many, uh, even non-Adventist Christians have, we just read that one from that one author. Many of them reckon, any, the serious re readers of, of Greek and study students and so forth will generally accept that. So this idea of the resurrection, if God can raise people from the dead, certainly he could create them at the beginning. Yes. Because he's going to be recreating them. So, you know, why do people who believe in a second coming not be and resurrection not believe in creation? Yeah. 
There's, yeah, it, yeah, it doesn't make any sense. Obviously, people have gotten carried away with trying to figure out how God will put back exactly the same little pieces of matter to form each human body. That's not necessary. God is a, uh, I mean, and for some people, they'd be thankful that it wasn't put exactly yeah. the same way. <laughs> All it really matters, or what you are, is right here. The rest of this is. Just a, a carry, uh, so it carries carry, around. And it might be a real burden the, for some people. The neurologist among us will say amen to that. Uh, that's the truth, absolutely. And it's actually not just the brain, but the brain as it was at its prime. Yeah. Because well, most of us have deteriorated brains. Yeah. Well, this is not necessary. God is a perfect copy of everything in our brains, and he can place that so-called software and those data files into any kind of new body that he chooses to give us. Downloading from the cloud, as we sometimes talk about today, try to imagine what it would be like to have a perfect new body which would never grow old or deteriorate in any way. Are you looking forward to that experience? Yeah. Wow. Have you ever discussed a second coming with someone who believes in the secret rapture? What would you say to them that might raise questions about their belief? Ask them why they believe that idea and if they know of anyone who has been raptured. Of course, they will say, well, maybe it's not within seven years of the second coming yet. It hasn't happened yet, they say. It hasn't happened yet. Because I, they think that they're the ones going. Yeah. Does that mean that anyone who, who dies has missed out on the secret rapture? 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 19 will make no sense at all if human beings in some form such as a soul or spirit go to heaven at death. We can trust in the fact that Jesus rose from the dead in his own power and we can know that he has the power to raise us at his second coming. Look at the summaries of the key passages that we have explored in this lesson and consider what they say about the state of the dead as quoted from page 106 from the Adult Sabbath School Teachers Guide adult Sabbath school Bible study guide with the Bible quotations added here. So we've got a series of, of, of verses and we've looked at these, many of them already, but let's just review them again to see if we can come to some conclusions. We're gonna have a reference and a comment and then a verse and see how that, how that goes together. We to start with Hebrews 11, 39 and 40. Heroes of faith, do not receive their heavenly reward until we receive ours. And then the verses, 11, Hebrews 11, 39 and 40, what a record all of these have. And if you remember, Hebrews 11 is what? What's in Hebrews 11? Faith chapter. The faith chapter. It talks about all of them, starting with Seth and Adam and so forth, all the way down to Abraham and so forth. What a record all these have won by their faith. Yet they did not receive what God had promised because God had decided on an even better plan for us. His purpose was that only in company with us would they be made perfect. In other words, they're waiting to be resurrected and taken to heaven with us. Okay? So, Jim, the next one. This, from the 1 John 5, 11 and 12, this text teaches that only those who are in Christ have eternal life. Therefore, the implications are clear. We are not endowed with immortal, quote, souls, because only those who choose Christ will receive eternal life. 1 John 5, 11 and 12, this testimony is this. God has given us eternal life, and this life has its source in his Son. Whoever has the Son has this life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. From the Good News Bible. So, Kerry? Our hope of eternal life and resurrection come from the resurrection of Jesus. If we don't rise at that time, it means that Christ did not rise. If that is true, then we all die and stay dead forever. Okay, and we already looked at 1 Corinthians 15, and we're running a little short on time, so we'll move on. Gordon? John 14, 1 to 3, Jesus promised a place to prepare a place for us and come back to get us. This promise would be unnecessary if we were already in heaven. Okay. John 14, 1 to 3, quoted, 
Jesus said, do not be worried about this, Jesus told them, believe in God and believe also in me. There are many rooms in my Father's house and I am going to prepare a place for you. I would not tell you this if it were not so. And after I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to myself so that you will be where I am. Good News Bible. Okay, Myra. Um, John 6, 35 to 54. Jesus says four times, that he will raise him, humans, up on the last day. If humans will be raised, then, we, then they need to come back to life after death. This precludes living somewhere else as souls or spirits. In John 6, 35 through... Oh. Here's, the, here's the evidence for that yeah. statement. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Jesus told them, those who come to me will never be hungry. Those who believe in me will never be thirsty. Now I told you that you have seen me, if I go back to what I grew up learning that memory verse. Mm. I told you that you have seen me, but will not believe. Everyone whom my father gives me will come to me. I will never turn away anyone who comes to me because I have come down from heaven and do not own, I will come do down not from, my own. Yeah, not my own, but will of him who sent me. And it will be, and it will, I'm sorry, I can't read this. Can you? I'll read it. Okay. And it is the will of him who sent me that I should not lose any of all those he has given me, but that I should raise them all to life on this la on the last day. For what my Father wants is that all who see the Son and believe in him should have eternal life, and I'll raise them to life on the last day. The people started grumbling about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. So they said, this man is Jesus, son of Joseph, isn't he? We know his father and mother. How then did, does he now say he came down from heaven? Jesus answered, stop grumbling among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him to me and I will raise him to life on the last day. The prophets wrote, everyone will be taught by God. Anyone who hears the Father and learns from him comes to me. This does not mean that anyone has seen the Father. He who is from God is the only one who has seen the Father. I am telling you the truth. He who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the desert, but they died. But the bread that comes down from heaven is of such a kind that whoever eats it will not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. The bread that I will give him is my flesh, which I give so that the wrong, so that the world may live. This started an angry argument among them. How can this man give us his flesh to eat, they asked. Jesus said to them, I'm telling you the truth. If you do not eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will not have life in yourselves. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them to life on the last day. And I'm sure they were, I mean, they were just tied up in knots when he said all that kind of stuff. Okay, Jim? 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. For what is that? Yeah. That's fine. But then we go down to 1 Corinthians well, 15. There's oh, a that comment and then there's there? a... Okay. Okay. Yeah. The mystery is the transformation of the righteous living at the second coming. The resurrection of the dead and transformation of the living righteous happen at the same time. All of this item above page 106 to the Bible study guide. Yeah. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 55. Okay, that's Carrie's. Confused. The mystery is the transformation of the righteous living at the second coming. The resurrection of the dead, the transformation of the living righteous happen at the same time. All of this item above is from page 106 of Adult Teachers Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. Okay. Gordon? And then 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 55. Listen to the secret truth. We shall not all die, but when the last trumpet sounds, 
we shall all be changed in an instant as quickly as the blinking of an eye. And we read this before. Mm -hmm. For when the trumpet sounds, the dead will be raised, never to die again, and we shall all be changed. For what is mortal can be changed into what is immortal. What will die must be changed into what cannot die. So when this takes place and the mortal has been changed into the immortal, then the scripture will come true. Death is destroyed. Victory is complete. Where death is your victory? Where death is your power to hurt? Good News Bible. Yeah, we have done a lot of quoting in this lesson and in our previous lesson, and that's because these events are so momentous that we don't want to, I, I hope you don't mind our quoting those who know from authority, God himself speaking or his apostles or someone who was inspired by God gives us this information and not just our theories about what happened. Consider some additional information about death and the condition of the dead. Okay, I will try again here. Revelation 21, 4 tells us that there are, there will be, be no more tears and there will be no more death. Let us not make the mistake of implying that that we are inherently have immortality. Bible study guide says the absence of death does not mean that the human life will be independent of God who alone possesses unborrowed inherent immortality. Glorified humans will continue to depend on the Creator for their life support. It's from Roy Gain. And a lot of references yeah. there. So we have this text that is the key to understanding that particular thing. First Timothy 6.16, He alone is talking about God is immortal. He lives in the light that no one can approach. No one has ever seen him. No one can ever see him. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. So who only has immortality? God alone. Only God. Okay. Jim, you want to take that next section there? The river of life and the tree of life mentioned in Revelation 22 demonstrate that humans will always be dependent on the source of life that is God. He also will be their light, Revelation 22, 5. Although that doesn't mean that the sun and moon will not be there. The fact that humans will be eating fruit from the tree and drinking water from the river demonstrates that the humans will be resurrected with corporal forms and not simply by disembodied spirits, and not be disembodied spirits. Humans will be resurrected to live forever in bodily form, not with the present natural, unscriptural, that is Greek. Unspiritual. Natural, unspiritual. unspiritual that and is a Greek sukios, body, soma, that decays and dies, but with the body soma that is immortal because it is spiritual, pneumaticos. 1 Corinthians 15, 44. From the Salvation Contours of Adventist Soteriology, page the two. The body is changed, but the person does not become a disembodied spirit. That from that book. Mm -hmm. The Carrie? Greek word. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Gary. The Greek word. The Greek word for first fruits is a parche and means first and foremost, first fruits. Second, a proportionate gift from earnings, a thank offering, or third, it could mean an offering. The Israelites would present the first fruits, the first sheaf of the harvest in the temple, and the priest would wave it before the Lord. All these actions happened on Nisan 16 and were a reminder of a pledge of a full harvest. Now let's talk about that for a moment. In the Passover ceremony, there was um, the whole thing that went through, that Jesus was, Jesus was um, crucified on Passover day and so forth, then the re rest of the two months after, but then on Sunday he arose. And what happened, that was the day when they presented their first fruits. The very first barley, usually it was barley first, was the first fruit that they were able to actually harvest and they came on that day. And guess what happened on that day? Go ahead, Fasc fascinatingly. Oh, Jesus was resurrected on Nisan 16. Therefore, he served as the pledge, 
the first sheaf, the first fruits of the full harvest of all the believers who will be resurrected one day as well. But it's important to notice that the harvest appears only when he comes again. So there is no harvest that already is physically in heaven, except for those whom we are told were resurrected or taken straight to heaven, such as Enoch, Elijah, Moses, and those who were raised from the dead during Christ's resurrection. Jesus' newness of life points to the new life and resurrection of all the believers. So basically what we're saying is that Jesus, the, on the day when the first fruits were supposed to be presented to God, rose from the dead as the first fruits, and then he gathered all those people that resurrected with him. And, and in Matthew 27, 52 says that the death of Jesus, the grave broke open, and many of God's people who had died were raised to life. Um, go ahead, Gordon. Romans 6, 4, by our baptism then we are buried with him, and shared his death in order that just as Christ was raised from death by the glorious power of the Father, so also we might live a new life. Good News Bible. Romans 2, 5 to 12, Ephesians 5, 2 Corinthians 1, 6 to 10, make it very clear that those who will be resurrected at the second coming of Christ are those who are in Christ. At that time, Satan and all his evil companions would be confined to this earth for a thousand years, and that whole story is in Revelation 20. To those who question how this righteous, how the righteous will die, will be able, who die, will be able to come forth in a different kind of form with a different body, Paul used the example of a seed cast into the soil. It is buried in the ground, out of sight, but then it responds to the natural forces that God gives it, and it produces a brand new plant. At this point, Paul highlights four differences that can be assigned with the, uh, could be anticipated with the resurrection, and we're not going to have time to finish all these verses. Um, and you're welcome to get our handout. It's there available online. Um, in these discussions about the future resurrection of the righteous to eternal life, what is most appealing to you? What gives you the greatest hope? At the second coming, what will you be looking forward to most of all? Are you looking forward to seeing Jesus? Seeing family and friends who previously have passed away? Or possibly learning more details about many Bible stories? Anyway, all of that will happen, and I look forward to it. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for these blessed hopes that we have. The New Testament hopes that we've studied today that helps uh, help, help to give us some idea of what, what is coming. May those blessed things be, come soon is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.